Right. Okay, folks, I apologize for the slight delay. Um, those of you who are regulars here will know that I am somewhat technologically challenged and all the people will normally bail me out. I'm not here. So clearly I, also, I will be cursing them under my breath like for deserting me in my hour of need. Anyway, so I'm, I'm Anthony Reddy. I'm the director of the Oxford Centre for Religion and Culture. This is the first of four seminars in a joint programme we have with the Dialogue Society and we are pleased and honoured that to have a number of our colleagues here with us. Some have travelled as far as London, but I know others have come from other parts of the country as part of the Dialogue Society, as well as, as, well as other regular members. Our speaker this evening on the theme of Muslims and Dialogue is Dr. Saria. And as I'm terrible at mangling names, she's given me permission to say, to simply say Dr. Saria CC. <laughs> That's obviously she has a proper name, but as I'm on camera, and as it's been recorded, I don't want to be recorded having mangled her name, given that I hate when people do that to my name. So anyway, so we'll some probably Dr. Saria. Saria. Saria even. Saria. I can't get that bit right. Dr. Saria is going to speak on Muslims and dialogue, and we are in your hands. Thank you very much indeed, Anthony. You want me to come back? Okay, right, technology. So I was once called um, Saria Chevrolet on, on national radio. Um, what the presenter did not realize is me and my husband are petrol heads, so we were a bit chuffed that, you know, I was a car. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm really grateful to be here. Thank you, Anthony, for that introduction. Thank you, Dialogue Society for co-hosting this um, and, the, and the Regents College. Um, and, and a big thank you to my colleague, Paul, um, who's invited me. I know you're there, Paul, but I can't see you or hear you because you've, I know you've muted yourself. He's, he's got COVID, so he, he can't be here, but he is a long time mentor and, and a colleague. And I'm, I'm very grateful to him for inviting me. Um, I was very interested in, in you know, two things when I saw the conceptualization of this particular um, seminar series. I was really interested to see that, A, there was a lot of emphasis on positionality, and you've got a humanist speaker to speak around humanism in dialogue. You've got a Muslim speaker, yours truly, to speak about Muslims in dialogue. So I did find this agency giving to people who conform to a particular identity in the context of dialogue, I think useful and important. What I also found really, really interesting was the emphasis, not just on interfaith dialogue, but also on interconvictional dialogue. And, and I think interconvictional works for me um, in three ways. The first is, you know, interconvection, interconvictional, I never get that right, allows a space for voices and, you know, that are not part of the traditional religious labels to be part of the table to come to the table and engage in dialogue. I think that's really, really important given the, the, the religion or belief dynamics of this country. It opens up another space in that, you know, Muslims in Britain, Muslims elsewhere, get a wide continuum of identity positions. Whereas for some, you know, some Muslim Islam is the be all and end all of their identity. You know, they are, all their actions are determined by their faith. There are lots of others for whom Islam is a cultural identity or a, a, a political identity. And I'm thinking about, for example, the young Muslim woman I met who were not, not, not in this room here, two youngish Muslim women. I'm not young, she's young. Um, you know, lots of Muslim women who might wear the hijab, you know, superficially, they're, they're completely Muslim, but start talking to them. And although Islam is a really, really important part of their identity, it isn't in terms of, you know, a religious identity, it's a cultural identity. It's determined by food that they eat, uh, by things that they do. And so interconvictional opens that space for Muslims and Christians and Jews who conform to that particular identity position, but who do not engage with the faith again, to have a part, to be part of the table uh, and engage in conversation. And the last thing I think um, why I like interconvictional so much is because it opens a space that's unconnected to faith, but is a meeting point of convictions that people hold. For example, these might be convictions around anti-racism. 
or this might be convictions around you know, climate change and addressing climate change. These are issues that are shared across religious and non-religious identities, religion or belief identities. Um, these are issues that might not necessarily form part of you know, the interfaith, intercultural, intercommunicational dialogue you know, subject area. But nevertheless, I think moving forward, these um, non-religious subject areas can become a place of you know, where communities and people can find uh, common terms, come to common terms to engage in dialogue, to en and join um, in good. And, and a few of you will notice I'm now you know, reverting to Islamic theological language. Anyway, moving on then, because this debate is, you know, I, because of the emphasis on a positionality, I thought I'd start with mine, work, work. Yeah, yeah, it's worked. So I've noticed I always, you know, I've started doing a, a most presentation that I start with a slide on my identity, my positionality, and this draws upon um, a people like, you know, whose name I'm guys in Huberman who talk about foregrounding researcher positionality in research about subject areas that are contentious. Islam apparently is one of those contentious areas. So he says he encourages researchers, they encourage researchers to be transparent about who they are in, in research. I'm also a feminist scholar. And so my emphasis on identity draws on a long tradition in, in feminist geography, for example, people like Gillian Rose and, and Farhana Sultana who talk about identity as something that enables research. And by being transparent about who you are, not as an exercise in self-humanity, but an exercise in, in clarifying where this research is coming from. So, so that's me. Um, lots of things. I put wife, mother, and daughter. I'm a little scared to come out as a sociologist of religion in a theological college. So you stay away. Any theologians as well, okay? I am a sociologist, avowedly so. Um, and my research is underpinned by, by you know, a feminist pragmatist epistemological stance that emphasizes A, the need to give agency to underheard voices, but also the relativity of truth and truth is determined by personal experience. And you'll see why I'm saying, you know, all of this faffy academic stuff that I prefer not to say, but have to say today. Paul outed me on Twitter last week as, as a Muslim woman who came from a multicultural family. You know, I grew up in the Catholic faith. Um, I'm Muslim now. I've grown up in different parts of the world. Um, in India, Britain is my adopted home. I did grow up in the Middle East. And every time I meet somebody from Bahrain, they seem to think I'm completely Bahraini. I don't know what it is, but they pick up that I spent a few years of my life in Bahrain. So I think my identity, both as an academic, but also as a person, informs how I've arrived at this presentation today. Now, again, the theologians will probably tell me off, but as a sociologist, I am committed to methodology. And what I'm going to present today is a reflective ethnography, you know, over 10 years of engaging with British Muslims in different contexts. In, well, largely in Britain, largely plural. I removed the ist from pluralist because I'm not quite sure we're pluralist. Nevertheless, I've engaged with British Muslims around different subject areas and underpinned by this feminist pragmatist stance, I'm going to reflect on them and see what, where, how, you know, do Muslims do dialogue? And, and if at all, what might be the future uh, in terms of priorities for dialogue with Muslims and dialogues that Muslims engage with, with wider community. So, you know, both way dialogue. Um, I, I did say I am not a theologian, but I, I could not resist pretending for one slide that I possibly could be one. And, and that's the scary bit, so don't tell me off. But I wanted to start with Ebu Patel, you know, the, the American uh, interfaith activist who talks about the sacredness of diversity and diversity as something that is intentional part of the divine uh, plan. And he talks about, you know, the creation as set, talks about creation as set out in chapter two of the Quran. And he talks, and he, he, he describes how creation stored, the creation story in Islam culminates with um, Adam, the first, you know, human being, according to the Abrahamic tradition, uh, being 
positioned as the best of creation and, and you know, by virtue of that humankind as being the best of creation, better than the angels, the angels question it. And it turns out that Adam is better than the rest of the creation. Humankind is, you know, the nominated wise gerent on the earth simply because they know the names. Now, for Ibu Patel, the emphasis on names in the Quran is something that to him indicates the, the significance A of diversity as, as part of you know, creation and, and the divine plan, but diversity also as something that is worth knowing. And this is sort of confirmed in, in verse 13, chapter 49 of the Quran, and, and it goes, you know, oh mankind. <coughs> Indeed, we have created you, you know, out of a single couple, you, it ch changes as per the translation. Key to our discussion today, made you people and tribes so that you may know one another. And I, I lay emphasis again on the word know. And I think this knowing is not just a superficial knowing, you know, our, this colors of our skin, our values. This is knowing in the pragmatist philosophical sense. You know, John Dewey tells us to know the other so that we may know oneself better. Um, you know, and I talk about it in my in my work around Islam on campus. I talk about the need for this knowing to transcend simple, you know, ideas of you know, bridges of toleration, but to move towards bridges of of respect. Um, I want to draw your attention then to to verse sixty four of chapter three. Come to common terms. The Quran enjoins upon humankind to come to common terms. And I've heard many an evangelical Muslim speaker you know, talk about come to common terms mean, you know, we, we all become Muslim, we all believe in, in, in one God and the finality of Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him. Um, but I, you know, from a sociological sense, and then I'll develop this as we go, I'm beginning to argue that there might be a different kind of common terms that we all have to come to one, where irrespective of our diversities, we can talk about, you know, diversities of faith positions, can talk about shared issues of significance for all of humanity. Um, and finally, and then, then I'll stop pretending to be a theologian. I want to draw your attention to Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him, farewell sermon, which I think is an important call both to you know, anti-racist philosophies, but also philosophies about peaceful coexistence. And, and this is a quote from his um, farewell sermon. All mankind is from Adam and Eve, an Arab has no superiority over a non-Arab, nor a non-Arab has any superiority over an Arab. Also a white has no superiority over a black, nor does a black have any superiority over a white, except by piety and good action. Now I know here um, the labels used are ethnic labels, but again, going back then, Arab was synonymous with Muslim, you know, 1400 years ago, that has changed now. And I'm wondering whether we can in include within this uh, a commitment to interfaith intercultural dialogue. But that, and again, asking you to, to remember, uh, you know, stay with me um, on the idea of coming to common terms is where I end my pretense of being a theologian, because that is not what I am. And I'm going to draw you away from institutional theology to theology that is everyday, religion that is lived in, in communities, by individuals, by people who have to make their own decisions as they journey through faith. Um, so I draw my understandings of everyday religion, everyday faith from the French philosopher Michel Sertou. Now, Sertou uses the image, the metaphor of a city, where the, you know, where the big skyscrapers are the institutions of faith. It, in, in Muslim context, that might be the mosque, that might be the foundational texts. And then he talks about people who want to get to place A, from place A to place B, they've got to navigate their way through this city. Um, now the best, the city I know best is, is Coventry because that's my home city, my hometown. And Coventry, has anybody here been to Coventry? Okay, do you know Coventry? Have you driven in Coventry? What do you think of the ring road? Okay, very good. What do you think of the ring road? Ah, anybody else has opinions? <gasps> I You're a man, you know, you have my heart there. <laughs> well, I'm a bit of a petrol head, like I said, and I love the Coventry Ring Road. Every summer they have races around the Coventry Ring Road. And me and my husband have been planning to do it, but we've got children. 
and then you know children racing down you know madly uh, <laughs> not not a good idea when they're older we will race around the ring road but when you think about coventry and the ring road people want to get from you know one place to the other one side of the city to the other side some people would avoid the ring road completely some people don't know it some people you're not sure are you and you reasonably are okay driving it yeah and i would probably take a few rounds around it at you know trying to avoid with the cameras as i do but that's what sir too says as we are navigating the institutions you know coventry ring road the institutions of faith we make our own decisions we getting from place a to get it, getting to place b we either use our own you know positive preferences like me do a bit more of it or like anthony would avoid it and this is that's kind of you know the continuum of religious experience you don't necessarily conform to everything we engage in messy complex untidy negotiations you know as mcguire tells us and and sometimes these these negotiations around our religious identity and our religious practice differ from from official doctrine not necessarily in a way that um disputes it but in a way that diplomatically finds a space that is you know your own armament talks about you know this this lived religion and she says so we define it by by what it excludes we define it by excluding the institutions but also we need to start thinking about what it includes and so it includes uh, an attention to laity not clergy not elites practices rather than beliefs practices outside of religion religious institutions rather than practices inside them and it emphasizes individual agency autonomy rather than you know collectivities or tradition and and she says she concludes substantively the focus and practice has encompassed dimensions of embodiment discourse and materiality now when i go into muslim a part of my ethno you know research i go into well actually before there so she does talk about the need to develop and enhance understandings of everyday religion that are still to um focused on 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 christian ways of of and, and on christian eth ethnographic studies um and i agree with her there is room to you know change and widen this debate and i'm minded that's the example i was trying to give you a minute ago but when i go into the most the women section of a mosque you know and if it's one of those i remember going into one and seeing there in addition to the prayer mats and the usual you know mosque paraphernalia that you see i also saw toys i also saw one of those little plastic bead and thread bracelet making cases and i could imagine how these muslim women have come there to pray but they've also got to you know encourage and distract rather than encourage distract their children so that they can pray pray and this it it changes from a place of institutional uh um, worship to a place where women are negotiating with the needs of their children with their own needs to 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 worship and and to pray and also with what they feel is their commitment to you know the to their creator to god almighty whom they believe in and and that is really what everyday religion is is all about the complexities that are individual rather than communal but i think in muslim context the more we emphasize you know live religion we also continue to see the significance of institutions but in ways that are perhaps not the same as the creators of these institutions and the such now every day live religion in the context of muslims and dialogue um you know two questions what does an emphasis on lived everyday religion bring to <clears throat> interfaith bring to the interfaith in the convictional tent um i'm going to try and talk about that ethnographically briefly and and what is the terrain on which the tent the this tent is located now for muslims with the excessive um scrutiny that diverse muslims experience you know with things like prevent hanging over muslims um interfaith dialogue for some muslims has almost become this this protective shield i will engage in interfaith dialogue in order to protect my credentials that does not negate the significance of their dialogue but it does show you know where the the amount of pressure that some of the scrutiny can have on muslim communities now about a decade and a half ago robin richardson wrote about the the different 
uh, themes that, that underpin how Muslims are represented and, and perceived in the popular this in, in popular discourses in policy discourses, and they talk about you know this this idea that Islam is somehow irrational, this idea that it is archaic, it's it's mean to its women, it's grumpy, and and these are you know although this was written a decade and a half ago, Peter Osborne, the journalist, wrote a book a couple of weeks ago, I think I might be getting this wrong. I bought it last week, so I don't quite know when it was published. But fairly recent, yet again, these, these tropes continue. They've not gone away in a decade and a half. In some ways, they've perhaps intensified. And so that's the terrain across which Muslims have to, some people, feel, some Muslims feel it's incumbent upon them to engage in dialogue. Others do it for the love of it. But, but there's certainly a pressure that Muslims have to address. And so if we were think, trying to think about the terrain on which the tent is located, it's not going to be a beautifully shaded hillock it's probably going to be rougher to me. Now I'm going to talk about these issues and concerns by drawing upon you know, three projects. Uh, the first one that I want to talk about is my work around uh, Muslim women. Uh, my PhD a decade ago spoke, not more than a decade, I'm getting really old, spoke to contemporary Muslim women. And more recently, I've been speaking to women who inhabited the first British Muslim communities in the 1890s onwards. Now, when I look at the 1890s communities, A, I had a bomb, I ha had what I like to describe a bombshell moment. I was going through these archives in a dusty library, suddenly started screaming around a bit and got told off by the librarian because I discovered that Muslim, both first mosques in Britain had Muslim women at the center of, found of you know, founding them. And on your screens, you've got Begum Shah Jahan from erstwhile Bhopal in India, who funded the mosque in Woking. The mosque in Liverpool that many of you will know about, by, you know, that was led, and that is known as the Abdullah William Mosque, was actually co-founded by a woman, Lady Fatima Cakes. But that's by the by, that I just have to say, everywhere I go as a feminist scholar, I have to say that. But what was really interesting in, for example, is that you know, the walking, the, the Liverpool mosque had a lady called Fatima Nafisa Keep, who came all the way from America um, and then gave lectures. What were her lectures about? Her lectures were on topics like what, how does Islam treat its women? How does, what is it like living under Muslim laws? Uh, her lectures were sold out. They were generally very well received. I found it intriguing that, you know, a hundred and 20 years ago, if my maths is right, 130 years ago, they were talking about the same issues that we talk about today. Um, and then I want to take you to some of the contemporary women that I spoke to. You know, and I've got Basaria's story written there. I, I, as part of my PhD, I spoke to lots of young Muslim women. We had a brief in that. I told these young Muslim women, can you create stories for me that I can show to audiences who are not Muslim. And within these stories, can you emphasize interfaith, intercultural dialogue? Now, as a researcher, I thought I knew it all. And I thought when I go and speak to these women, they'd create stories of this is what Islam is. It does not, you know, oppress us. Instead, these young women created stories of everyday life. Um, I'm going to show you one story, if it works. Will I have to stop sharing and share again? I think, uh, so. I think so. Yeah. yeah. Stop sharing. Screen. Screen sharing. That's where. Yeah, but I don't know. It should come from here. Screen sharing. Optimize for video clip. And that. So this is a story from a young woman called Basaria. You watch the story and I'll then tell you what happened. It's only three minutes long. So yeah, pay attention. Yeah. That's not on the largest screen. Uh, oh, it is on the Zoom, but it's not on there. Ah. Uh, oh. No. Okay, let's. Hi, um, my name is Basria. My friends call me Baz. Uh, I'm a young. Oh, okay. So we can hear it, but we can't see. Oh, okay. Okay. So we can hear it, but we can't see. Okay. 
<laughs> yeah, so we, we want to get the, tickets, but I think I'm gonna... the video is working here, but it's not We're working the there. Would you know what to do? Windows. Yes, um, it's, it's on Zoom, it's not on the screen. So everyone can see it. Yeah, yeah, everyone on Zoom can see it. <clears throat> And you need to put on the first screen. Stop share. Bear with his audience, you're getting there. Which one is it? Is it this one? It's, um, yeah, yeah, that one, yeah. Yeah, that one, yeah. No. Which one is screen? Which yeah, we can do that worst case, I guess. Mm -hmm. Worst case, I can check turn my laptop on. Then can watch from the laptop. And we can run this one as well. This one. What we were sharing? No, no, no. I did stop share. But this is the presentation set. Yeah. yeah. It's stuck somewhere. Yeah. Let's see it's Hi, um, my name is Basria. My friends call me Baz. Uh, I'm a young British Muslim and Manchester is home. I'm a firm believer that um, everyone has a capability to do something with their life, if only they were to avail the opportunity that life throws at them. Um, it's a matter of recognising their potential and believing in it. This is what I call ambition and I'm going to talk about mine. Since my teenage years, I've always been inspired by my father who is a lawyer and an imam, uh, a Muslim faith leader. Uh, I've always wanted to follow in his footsteps, as in practice my faith and become a legal professional. Uh, I've just recently completed my law degree at Warwick University and intend to go on to the legal practice course next year. I hope to be a successful, high-flying, jet-setting lawyer, and I think I am capable of being just that. This ambition was nurtured by my interest in society, politics and history, something which has grown and further solidified over the years. However, my desire of working in a legal field is a means to an end rather than an end itself. It is a stepping stone through which I want to move on to larger, bigger and more important things. In all honesty, my dream is to work in the voluntary and developmental sector, a career move which I see as my true calling. My motivation is to make a positive change in society, however minimal that may be. I want to do my bit in life. My faith teaches me to help others whenever and wherever possible, and my parents practice this and have inculcated this in me. For if you change one life, you have changed all of humanity. I want to work with children and give them a sense of hope. I have realized from my experience that often it is not aid that is required, but it's empowerment which is needed, as in empowerment to build and better their lives and hence their futures. Therefore, it's not aid that they need, but renewable sources of livelihood, including education, energy, work, incomes, and inspiration. So in order to enable them to stand on their own feet. Uh, I have realized that working towards this will give me true satisfaction and a sense of fulfillment something which paychecks and bonuses cannot attain. At the end of my life, when I stand in front of God, I hope to say to him, I did something for your people and only to please you, as we say in Islam, to attain his raza, which means his pleasure. To end, I would like to say that I know that God loves his people, as well as the fact that helping human beings means that in fact you are pleasing your Lord. These are my ambitions, all of which I believe are tangible and attainable in my lifetime. And this is my story. Um, so, during my, you know, that, that particular research project, I spoke to many women and very many women created, you know, their stories, stories that I shared with diverse audiences. What 
kind of flummoxed me. It's like I was saying, I expected women to create stories that would be about Islam. Instead, they created stories about life. The stories about their ambition, as in Basaria's story, but stories about going through difficult divorces, stories about you know, encounter, you know, having miscarriages, stories generally about walking to university one day and encountering a man at a bus stop and, and, and you know, talking to that man about dialogue. So these were stories about everyday life. And I remember being a little concerned, you know, what kind of a reaction am I going to get? Am I going to get uh, a reaction that, that answers my PhD question, which was about furthering interfaith dialogue around Islam and Muslims um, in, in Britain. Now, overwhelmingly, when people watch these stories and I showed it to diverse audiences who were not Muslim, um, I, you know, I counted up the statistics, you know, I, I mapped their, their attitudes towards Muslims before seeing the stories and then after, you know, I am a sociologist, we do like all our questionnaires and numbers. The end number was 80% of people felt they understood Muslim women better and were likely to, you know, make friends with the Muslim women. They felt their attitudes towards Muslim women had changed positively after watching these stories. And they said to me, these stories are not about that Muslim woman there. Um, I remember a group of undergraduates tell me after watching Basaria's story that ba Basaria is just like our friend Bess, who is similarly uh, you know, doing a degree in something, but who really, really wants to work in philanthropy and really wants to engage in social action for children. Other women told me about how, you know, other audiences told me about how a particular woman reminded them of a really stoic aunt, for example. And, and this commonality, this personal encounter, this sharedness of life, to me, represents a coming to common terms. But I'll hold it there and take you on to the next example. So the next example is from a large research project that I undertook with Professor Alison Scott Bauman from SOAS, Professor Matthew Guest from um, Durham, and Dr. Shilok Nagib from Lancaster. This was a large HRC funded grant and we looked at narratives of Islam on campus. Now I had a video for you to see, but I'm not going to show it to you A, in the interest of time, but B, because I'm a bit scared of technology now after what we've just encountered. But in this, this particular project, we went out to six higher education sites in the UK. Um, we interviewed staff and students. We ran a survey uh, that had 2000 respondents. Um, we sought to explore and understand how Islam is experienced and perceived on university campuses in the UK. Um, interfaith was very clearly one of the themes of or one of the foci for this project. And what we saw again here, like with the Muslim women's work, if there were organized interfaith dialogue activities, yes, they had success, but their success was mixed. Often interfaith dialogue events were preaching to the people who were already converted. But what we did see is like the quote on your screen, this is from an African male Christian student. And he spoke about, you know, when he, he was going to go on campus, he received, you know, he received a notification that his roommate was going to be a Muslim. And he says, I was so scared. I thought I'll drop, I, I, I'd better drop out of this course. Uh, but then he was convinced, you know, go on campus and, and then you can find somewhere else to live. But then he met his Muslim housemate um, and he says he probably changed my belief about Muslims. So I think it really cooled my previous perception. Okay, generally everyone associates Islam with terrorism, but for me right now, I've seen Islam in a different way, a uniting factor, a common denominator between people. And over and over again, we had similar stories where people, you know, the young people from different communities, different backgrounds, you know, met a Muslim either over coursework or in the halls of residence or, you know, at some event and, and they got on and as they got on and began to know the Muslims on their campus, um, there was dialogue taking place at a very small level, but perhaps the most powerful form of dialogue. In our survey of 2000 respondents, when we asked people, you know, what was your, what were the sources, where do you draw your you know, sources of information in relation to religion, overwhelmingly, you know, people had, I, you know, things like religious leaders, um, texts, but when it came to Islam, their two big sources were the media 
and then friends and family. And friends and family, I think, have, have the potential to counter some of the negative discourses around Islam. Now, this kind of personal encounter dialogue is not unproblematic, just as the theology is at the start you know, of my presentation are not unproblematic. When it comes to this kind of personal encounter, what we see is there are, we uncovered what we call the politics of encounter, where the questions are always directed towards one group. You do not ask, you know, the young man, uh, the young white British man, why does he wear jeans to his coat? But you would ask the Muslim woman, you know, why did she wear uh, her, her scarf? And so there is a power hierarchy in these dialogue activities in these personal encounters, that means one particular group is always the bearer, always has to have the answers and another other groups have questions of them. Nevertheless, this is, you know, if you're cognizant of these hierarchies, it remains a powerful space to, to engage in dialogue. Um, I also wanted to show you this slide. Um, this tried to map you know, Adam Dinham and, and others talk about passive diversity and active diversity. <clears throat> By passive diversity, they mean just the presence of different religious, ethnic, cultural groups. By active diversity, they mean, you know, the groups actually engaging with each other, trying to understand each other. Um, and I tried to map this. Um, this was qualitative data, so there's no... <coughs> I hope that's not COVID, but I've been coughing since I've come to Oxford. <clears throat> Pollen, hopefully. Um, <coughs> so we tried to map, you know, what was the model like in these different institutions? And we found, sorry, we found institutions where there was a lot of diversity, super diverse in London, but where these groups did not really engage with each other. And, and you know, we call that fragmented diversity. There were other places where, again, a lot of, di no, there was passive diversity was kind of there, not, not a lot of diversity, not a lot of active diversity. There were indifferences between groups. And I, you know, if you look at what, you know, peace theory, indifference isn't really, you know, a long-term solution to positive peace. You know, Galton talks about the need to engage, the need to know the different other. There was pluralist diversity where, you know, there was a lot of, there were diverse ethnic groups on campus and, and people got on to each other with each other. But there was this, this last category of incumbent diversity. Now this was particular to the Muslim colleges. There wasn't a lot of diversity on these colleges. I can't tell you which ones they are. They were Muslim higher education institutions, different parts of the country. Um, there wasn't a lot of diversity, all of these, their students, majority of them, 90% of them tended to be Muslim. Uh, the staff tended to be Muslim, but there was an active commitment to engaging in interfaith dialogue that emerged from their positionality as students and staff in Muslim environments. Not all of them wanted to have, to be the, the, the hall bearers of, of diversity, but nevertheless, they felt incumbent to do so. There was a social, they, they felt a social responsibility as students of Islamic theology, of Islamic sciences, to also then share that with their neighbors so that their neighbors understood them better. I'm now going to move on to the final project. Um, this project had nothing to do with interfaith dialogue. There is no interfaith, interconvictional dialogue written into any of its fundings or objectives. But I still think it's an act in interfaith dialogue. And this was my work that, that Aisha knows here about, you know, Muslim heritage children in the British care system. Um, project close to my heart, but I'm not still talking to you about it because it's close to my heart. What I'm, I'm going to talk to you about it based on some of the findings that were really interesting. So we know we've got four and a half thousand Muslim heritage children in care in Britain, approximately that number. We know that there aren't enough Muslim adopters, foster carers coming to care for them. That is all by the by, and I'm not going to talk about that today. What I am going to talk about is, on the back of this project, we've trained over 600 social workers around Islam and Muslim heritage. Now these social work, and this, this training, this act of 
perhaps religious literacy, but I, I don't quite like that term, but raising the religious literacy about Islam was an act of dialogue. It was an act of dialogue that centered around the needs of these vulnerable children who needed appropriate social work provision for them. Me, um, my team, the social workers, we came together not because we all wanted to learn about Islam, but we came together because we had a shared conviction that children need to be looked after, children need to be, need to be found families. The best way to do this is by, at least in part, understanding Islam, because there are children who come into care for whom Islam has been part of their identity, um, and there are children for whom Islam is not part of their identity, they want to reject Islam. But, but in order to facilitate the best outcomes for children, whatever their relationship with Islam, we need to understand it. And so me and the social workers came together, we came to common terms around the need to meet children's needs. And that's really me now drawing to a conclusion. Um, I asked you right at the start theologically to, to think about this idea of coming to common terms and to think about this idea of coming to common terms as something that is more than just the central diktats of Islam. Um, this coming to common terms can also be around ideas of morality, ideas of shared values. You know, there's a big hoo-ha about British values at the moment, nobody knows them, but, but there are definitely shared ideas around morality. Everybody agrees that vulnerable children need homes, and so we'll do what it has to, what has to be done. Um, you know, Black Lives Matter, everybody marked in because it was really, really important that social justice is enabled by understanding the diversities of, of race and ethnicity. And we know almost all religious groups have a problem of racism that we tend to you know, brush under the carpet. But, and what enables this dialogue, this dialogue that is about coming to common terms, this dialogue about, you know, let's challenge climate change by, um, yes, you know, all our shared passions, but when it comes to the social capital within religious groups, also putting that into the kitty and using religious social capital, religious ideas and are protecting the environment, wise currency that actually transcend all religious values. You know, we can put all of that together. Key to this understanding is an understanding of intersectionality. <coughs> you know, so we might engage in dialogue because we are Muslim, but we might also engage in dialogue because I'm a Muslim, you're a Christian and you're a Jew and you're a humanist, but we've all got a shared, you know, commitment to something. And I think that shared purpose is what I'm hoping we can look for. I and mean, I think it is that shared purpose that has perhaps nothing to do with um, religious identity. It's more about the convictions that, that we all have that may come from our religion, that, but, 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 but may well come from elsewhere. But these convictions that can also benefit from, from religious thinking um, and, and, and where debates around these convictions can be moved forward through religious thinking and through the social capital that, that religions offer. And is that coming to common terms, which I think, you know, verse 64 <clears throat> Um, of chapter three of the Quran can also allude to. Um, on that end, on that note, that's, that's me. Thank you very much for coming. I hope I made it worthwhile. Not a theologian, but I'll always pretend to do a bit of theology. Thank you very much. I will uh, stop, stop the recording. Uh,